Um, up next, we have uh, Dave Brown talking about the DIY electric car. So enjoy. Alrighty, thanks for coming out. Um, I'll try and go through this first part pretty quick since we're a little behind. Um, my name is Dave Brown. Um, I'm, I go under the name RegEdit on the DC forums or uh, Volkswagen at live.com if you have any questions after the con. Um, be sure to download the latest copy of the presentation from the website after it's up. A little background about me. I have eight years experience in IT, three years in IT security, and I've been doing electronics and other stuff for 12 years. Uh, a few projects I've done. My first big thing was first robotics. I was the programming and electronics guy. And I like to build all kinds of stuff. Usually I'm working in the garage when I have spare time. So I'm just going to cover real quick over the history of EVs, um, some acronyms, pros and cons, what you can use them for, the parts you need, the layout, um, some open source hardware stuff, and tools and the steps to actually do it. So EVs have been around for a long time. They're not something new. They've been around for about 150 years. Uh, they're just now starting to make a comeback. Originally, electricity was really expensive. People didn't have it in their homes. And once oil was struck, it was a lot cheaper to drive gas cars. So uh, there have been a few events in history that have caused EVs to have surges. Um, there was a OPEC oil embargo that made all the manufacturers start making cars. And then also in California, whenever they pass carb mandates, that gets people interested also. And then recently we have the Tesla and Nissan Leaf and the IMEV and a few others that are hitting the market now. Primarily this is because of advances in smartphone batteries. They've really driven the battery technology so that it really makes an electric car feasible. So some acronyms you need to know. Um, I'm sure you know amps, volts, amp hours is how you measure a battery capacity. Watts and watt hours is how much power you're getting out of that battery. Your watt hour per mile is how much power you need to go somewhere. Uh, miles per gallon equivalent, and that's how you can compare it to a, a gas car. Um, a BEV, battery electric vehicle, usually we just call it an EV. Uh, NEV, neighborhood EV, those are short range vehicles or low speed vehicles. And there's plug-in hybrids, that means it runs on gas, but you can also plug it in so you don't have to use gas. Then extended range EV and range extended EV are just weird things that GM made up because they didn't want to call it a hybrid. Okay, so EV pros. The, the best things about it is they're less complex, less maintenance, they're more efficient, they last longer, um, it's more sustainable because you're using electricity that can be generated in dozens of different ways. So this leads to energy independence. A lot of people that drive electric cars also have solar panels on their house, so they're completely self-sustained there. Also national security. If everyone was driving electric cars, we wouldn't need any oil from the Middle East. We could just do everything right here at home. And of course, there are environmental reasons too. Um, this is a picture of uh, an electric motor, the heart of an electric car. You can see there's only, there's only a few moving parts. The only things that wear at all are the bearings and the brushes. The bearings are usually good for about 250,000 miles which is about the life of most cars. And the brushes are usually good for one to 200,000 miles. And they can be replaced in about five minutes. So it's really easy maintenance and low cost for long sustainability. So the cons, of course, are the batteries. They're very expensive to purchase up front. Uh, newer batteries that are coming out now will last up to 10 years. So it's, if you build it into the price of the EV, then it's not really a big deal because you don't have to replace them. But compared to gas, it is low energy density. And so because of that, your range is also lower. Um, charging stations are an issue. Obviously, there aren't charging stations all over the place. And availability of them can be a problem, too. If you have a couple EV charging spaces in a parking lot and someone with a gas vehicle is parked there, you can't charge. Also, political issues sometimes cause problems. One of the places where I work occasionally, they went and installed some low-level chargers, and then people complained that the two EV drivers were getting 20 cents of free electricity a day, so they turned them all off. Um, charge time. Uh, this is, batteries really aren't the limitation for charge time. You can fill a, fill a battery as fast as you can fill a car with gasoline, but we'd, unless you have a front row seat at a nuclear power plant, you can't get that much power, so that's kind of an issue. 
So some things people uh, don't really understand about electric cars, lots of people think the grid can't handle it. They think we're going to need to double the amount of coal-fired power plants we need to do this. But since you charge electrics at night, it really doesn't even take hardly anything. Um, obviously, it'll be many, many years before a significant portion of us are driving electric cars, so it's no impact for now. But most, like in, in Texas, they're giving away electricity at night because they have to run their base loads anyway and nobody's using it. So it really has a very low impact on the grid. Also, my, uh, my car uses about 10% of my electric bill for the month, and electricity has been going down over the last five years running. Uh, a couple months this year, I had a $30 electric bill, so that's including the car. It really doesn't use hardly anything. Uh, some people think there's, it takes a lot more resources and causes more pollution. I'm not sure where this comes from, but some people call the Prius the most polluting car on the planet because the, the dirty batteries, which are 99% recycled anyway, and it uses such low amount of carbon emissions anyway that it really completely offsets it and then some in the first few months of use. Also, many people think lithium is very scarce. Uh, the reality is there's tons and tons of it stockpiled around the world. To make a battery, you only use a few ounces of it anyway. And in the U.S., we're just reopening a, a lithium mine that's the second biggest in the world. So there's really plenty of capacity there to, to make it. Also, many people think electric cars are inherently slow. And this comes from the fact that, I guess, in the 70s, there were some unfortunate vehicles that were made that didn't exactly go that fast and needed a downhill and a good breeze to get up to 30 miles an hour. But really, there, there isn't much limitation on the speed that you can use. And uh, the first car to ever hit 60 miles an hour was an electric car, so they can certainly do it. And here's a little clip I just wanted to show. This is a car turning right. It'll play. I guess not. Oh, well. Anyway, it's just a funny clip because the dude just does a UE right in the intersection and takes off. So uh, EV uses, there's lots of different things people use them for. One popular is neighborhood electric vehicles. Um, there's business that's starting to use them a lot. They're used in racing and my favorite, commuting. Neighborhood electrics, everyone's familiar with golf carts. Also, they're very popular for security and maintenance vehicles because they're quieter and there's no emissions, things like that. Um, people use them for grocery getters, just running errands around town. Um, this is because to have a low speed car, it's, it's very cheap to build and there's often cheaper maintenance. You sometimes don't have to do registration, you don't have to have your safety and emissions inspections, lots of things like that and because it depends on the state, but they can be a lot cheaper to operate. Now, businesses like them because if you're putting a lot of miles on a vehicle, it'll pay for itself really quick. Also, the best way to make an EV pay for itself is to maximize everything you have. If you buy a Tesla Roadster and you drive it 10 miles a day, obviously it's not going to pay for itself. But if you're using the full range constantly, then it will, it will make a big difference quick. Also, because the electric motors take pretty much no maintenance, it's really great for fleet vehicles. Um, racing, people love them there too. Uh, you have peak torque from zero RPM and a wide power band, so you don't have to shift much. With my car, it's a manual transmission, but I never shift it. I just leave it in second, and I can do zero to 45, no problem in second. And if I want to shift into third or fourth, then I can do up to 70. So my favorite use is commuting. 80% of the U.S. commutes are under 40 miles. So really, for the vast majority of people, a, a pretty cheap EV can take care of things. You're not using any power when you're sitting at a light or if you're waiting for a train or whatever. Stop and go traffic, you're not using anything. Uh, compared to gas, it costs less than two cents per mile compared to your 10 to 30 cents for a gas vehicle. Also, you have very high mileage, which is uh, measured in MPGE. So for your MPGE, there's two ways to calculate that. Well, two proper ways. There's some others that the OEMs come up with. Um, the first way is the empirical way, which is just using the energy equivalency. And based on that, my car gets 120 MPGE. And the other way to do it is to compare it with the price of gas and the price of electricity. So based on the average in my state right now, I get 150 on that. A month ago, it was over 200 compared to gas. 
So this is my car. It's a 74 Volkswagen Beetle. Range uh, originally 16 to 26 miles, 70 miles per hour. The conversion cost 6,000 bucks and took about 100 hours to get it on the road. I've probably spent at least 100 on it since then, just working on other stuff. Here's a list of parts. Uh, I don't expect you to be able to read all of them from here, but it's on the slides just so you can refer to it if you're interested. Uh, the big things, of course, are the donor vehicle, the motor and your controller, your, sh your shaft coupler and adapter plate, batteries, charger, um, and then you have contactors that are big relays and a bunch of other little things. I'll talk about the big ones here. Here's the EV layout. You've got your traction battery pack is what you call the, the battery that really moves the vehicle. You also have a 12 volt accessory battery. And then you've got your motor. You have motor controller, throttle, bunch of fuses all over the place just for safety when it's a charger. So with, um, with many projects, you have a time to money trade off. So conversion kits are one way to cut down on the time if you have extra money. Um, obviously, you, if you have loads of money in no time, you can just go buy a Tesla Roadster or a Nissan Leaf, whatever. Um, there's also the option to have a vehicle converted for you. There are a bunch of shops that do it, probably about 100 around the nation. Most of them are real low volume, but there are a few that have done several hundred vehicles. Um, conversion kits in general can make things easier for you, but I prefer to just use them as a checklist. You can usually get the parts cheaper by shopping around. So if you take a list and at least all the, the big ticket items, shop around, see what the best price you can get is. That's the way to go. So your motor, adapter plate, and shaft coupler. Um, you have to connect your motor to your transmission somehow. So for something like a Volkswagen Beetle, it's really easy. There's only four bolts that connect your transmission to your engine. So you just have to get those, those bolts off and then hook up the new ones. Um, this is what my original um, shaft coupler looked like. It's basically part of an old clutch disc that gets welded onto a, a coupler that goes onto the, the electric motor. Um, after a couple thousand miles, the teeth on mine got worn off, so I had to replace it with one of these springy types. They're supposed to be a lot better and, and last better. Um, my motor is pretty small. It's about the smallest you can use for a road-going vehicle, but it's good enough for a bug. Uh, it's 12 horsepower is the rating on it, but EVs are rated very differently from combustion cars. Uh, with your regular car, they rate it at the red line power, so what it's going to explode at, whereas an EV is rated at what it can run at forever. So my car could run at, well, on 12 horsepower, my could, the car could run at 60 miles an hour forever. Um, it peaks at about 60 horsepower, running at 120 volts, and you can bump the voltage up if you want, and you can run more amps through it if you want also, if you blow some extra air through it to, to cool it off better. Um, that's really the, the limit on uh, the power that an electric motor has is just the heating. You have to keep that under control. So some common motor options. There's warp motors in the U.S. Um, the, the people who make that also have an impulse motor that's a bit shorter and can fit better in some cars like VW Bugs. For people in Europe, the Kostovs are, are very popular. Uh, obviously, a motor is pretty heavy, so they can, they're usually around 60 to 150 pounds. So shipping costs can be pretty high. So Europeans like to go that route. Also a popular option is forklift motors. People take a 30-year-old motor, recondition it, and up the voltage on it. And they have a road-going motor for, that's, it's already been around for 30 years, and they'll put another 30 years on it. And total cost can be under 200 bucks. So that's a good low-cost option. So AC versus DC. Um, most of the OEMs are using Alternating current motors, they like these because they have regenerative braking. Uh, regenerative braking is, is very popular, but it's not really all it's cracked up to be. It only gives you about 10 to 30% of your energy back, but AC costs a lot more. So your typical motor with AC, your motor controller combo will be about 5,000, whereas for a DC, it'll be around two or 3,000. And most of what you get for regen, you could get anyway if you just drove smarter. If you drive like a jackrabbit, then regen will help you out a lot. But if you drive like a, say, a typical Prius driver, then you're not going to get anything out of the regen anyway. So it's not really helping you. Uh, also, AC motors are brushless. So um, remember the picture I showed you where you have the, the bearings and the brushes that wear out? Well, in an AC motor, you don't have those brushes to wear out. So the only thing that can ever wear out is the bearings, and the rest of it is good for life. 
Uh, motor controller, this is, base, this is what tells your motor how fast to go. It takes your full pack voltage and converts it into a PWM for the motor to handle. Uh, I'm running a Curtis 1221C and pretty much all, mo all um, at least DC mo motor controllers need some extra cooling on them. So that's why it has a heat sink on it. Uh, if you need extra cooling beyond that, you can throw a fan on the heat sink as well, but I didn't need that at all. Here's some different motor control options. The solitons are considered the top of the line. They have several different options. They've got a junior. This one's a soliton one. They have a new thing called the Shiva Destroyer that's pretty much designed for racing vehicles and can push over a megawatt of power. Um, the Zillas are also pretty high power. I'm running a Curtis. This is a picture of an AC Curtis. And um, one thing that's very popular now is the Open Revolt, which is an open source controller. Um, chargers, there's tons of chargers all over the place. I'm using a quick charger. It's not really that quick, but it works great for overnight. <coughs> My battery pack, uh, to begin with, I started out with 10 marine deep cycle batteries. These are not recommended for EV use, but I wanted to use them because I only needed 10 as opposed to 15 using golf cart batteries. Uh, and that way it keeps my weight down also. So with this pack, it was 600 pounds instead of the 900 that would be with full golf carts. So I started out with these, plus they had a great warranty. So when I drove them into the ground, I could replace them for pretty cheap. Um, it's 15 kilowatt hour pack total running at 120 volts. Um, to figure out how much battery power you need, here's the calculations. Basically, you take the range that you need, times it by your watt hours per mile. Now to figure out your watt hours per mile, you can look and see what other people are using, how much power they're getting, or you can take an estimate where basically you take the weight of the car, divide it by 10, and that's about what your watt hours per mile will be. Um, you divide it by 50% depth of dip discharge for a lead acid battery. Even deep cycle batteries don't like to be cycled that deeply, so you don't really want to go beyond 50% on a regular basis if you want the batteries to last long. And there's something called the Pukert effect. Every battery has a sticker rating. And that sticker rating is if you take 20 hours to drain that battery, that's how much power you get out of it. Obviously, in a car, you're not going to spend 20 hours draining the battery. You're draining about one hour, maybe half an hour. So you can't get nearly as much. Usually, it's somewhere between 70 or 60 percent. So we throw that in there. So for mine, it works out. It gives me a 15-mile range. That's my nominal range. You can use 80 percent for the depth of discharge for an occasional thing if you need more than that. So that's why mine has a range of 15 to 26 depending on how far I take the batteries. So for lithium batteries, you don't have that pukert effect. So you can use a lot more of the, the batteries. Also, you can discharge them down to 70 or 80 percent without hurting the batteries. So you can get a lot more out of them. So battery options. Um, lead acid has historically been the, the go-to option. Even 100 years ago, the presidential limo got 80 miles off lead acid batteries. Um, the vehicles that were made back in the 70s and again in the 90s mostly ran on lead acid batteries and many of these batteries were still good today but the OEMs usually patent squat or buy out companies and make them disappear so you're not allowed to use most of those. Uh, so everyone just uses golf cart batteries for the most part because they're designed for traction uses they'll last lots longer than the marine deep cycles that I used. Um, they last about 500 to 700 cycles which is two to three hundred years. Depending on your usage, some people manage to get five to seven years out of them. But uh, lithium batteries have gotten so much better in recent years that there's really no reason to be using lead unless you're just really, the option is lead or no EV. That's the only case you'd want to use lead. Otherwise, you should just go lithium. Um, there's lots of great options out there. Unfortunately, none of them are in the US right now. Pretty much everything comes from China or Korea. Uh, here's some different types of batteries. These square ones are called prismatics, and the big companies that make those are Calb, Sinopoly, and Winston. Um, Calb has a distributor in California, so they're one of the, the better options right now. There's also cylindrical batteries. The most popular ones are Headways right now. Those ones are great because they have little screw-on terminals, so even though you need, they're smaller and you need a lot more of them, they're easier to combine. Uh, previously, people used cylindricals from A123, but they were, they're the ones that come in DeWalt battery packs. And A123 doesn't sell to people, so the only way you could make a battery pack out of those was to buy tons of DeWalt battery packs for tools and rip them apart and steal all the cells out of them. So obviously it's a pain to do that. 
Um, A123 also has these new pa pouch cells. Uh, when their, their production for the Fisker Karma dropped off, these cells went crazy in China, being sold on the gray market, so lots of EVers were snapping them up pretty cheap. They were getting sell sold for about 12 bucks each, whereas A123, through their distributor, sells them for about 60 so it was a great option for lots of people, but they're a lot more work to put together into a pack because they don't have any terminals on them. They just have these little tabs. And so lots of people are working on creative ways to, to combine them into packs. So these, these cells, you need four of them to match a regular car battery, a 12 volt battery. They're at 3.2 volts nominal each. And they'll last for anywhere from 2,000 to 5,000 cycles, depending on the manufacturer and how you drive them. So. Most people are expecting these to last for eight or ten years. Obviously, they haven't been around long enough for us to really know that, but that's what people are expecting. Um, some of them could last as long as 15 or 20. We don't really know when the calendar life will, will start to have a significant impact on it. They can test the cycle life, but there's no telling with the calendar life. So your, your lead versus lithium. Obviously, lead is cheaper up front. They're less sensitive because a flooded lead battery, you can't overcharge. All it does is turn into a fuel cell once it's full. So it just gasses, and all you have to do is add water to it, and it's okay. Whereas a lithium battery, if you overcharge it, you'll vent it, which destroys the battery. Um, there's no balancing necessary with lead because it, it self-balances at the top. Whereas with lithium, you have to make sure all your batteries are at the exact same capacity. Otherwise, one of them will go over before others get fully charged. Lead also has a it has a great much greater slope on the discharge curve so you can tell how much juice you have based on your pack voltage but lithium has a very flat curve so you can't really tell you have to use special tools to tell you how much power you've used <clears throat>